Good day. Earlier this year, I was invited at IMTC, which is the International Money Transfer Conference in Barcelona, and this was my presentation regarding remittances. I've titled it Six Easy Pieces and Six Not-So-Easy Pieces. The title comes from Richard Feynman, who's a Nobel laureate in physics. He wrote many papers called Six Easy Pieces, Six Not-So-Easy Pieces. I decided to take the same, very same title and apply it to my remittance presentation. The reason I did so and I chose specifically this is because Richard Feynman was known for his acute observation. You know, he steps outside the box, he looks at it from very dis uh, things at very different perspectives and then forms an opinion on it and, and does so with scientific backing, not just on hearsay. There is a principle, it's called the Daffodil Principle. It says that if you give something 99% for 365 days a year, well, guess what? The total is only 0.03. But if you give 101%, that 1% more, just 1% more for 365 days a year, you can see the result is 37.8. And that's, that's the difference. That slight extra push that you are able to give can have a tremendous impact on your result. And that is what I'm trying to emphasize in this presentation. The extra impact that I'm trying to emphasize is the emphasis on research, the emphasis on education, the emphasis on observation, which we'll discuss. My very good friend and co-host Brian Romley uh, is accredited with this statement, empirical paraxis. The empirical paraxis basically means going into an environment and observing, not interacting with the environment, but observing. Observing how people are doing things, how the elements are interacting with each other, how the interactions are being done, what are the results, what are the outputs, what are the inputs, uh, what, are, what are catalysts and what are not. It's by this empirical observation that we can derive at many, many things. It is with this empirical praxis that we can come to conclusions and we can have a path chosen for us as to the method forward or the way forward. The data that is going to be shown to you has been gathered um, by myself for two years plus. We've spoken to about 170 plus MTOs. Uh, we've talked to over a thousand people. This was about 500 I wrote over here because I lost some notes, but uh, I, now it's about over a thousand people. We have, we've visited 18 locations. We've had over 500 phone calls. So it, this is not just based on hearsay. This is based on real data that we've talked to people um, institutions, small and large, and amalgamated their data to come up with what we are about to show you. So the one of the things that is easy, uh, that, that uh, faster payments, one of the things that is very easy for MTOs to jump on board is faster payments, obviously. Real-time payments will be the norm in about three to five years' time. Uh, various studies point to it. I think SDA, which is same day ACH in the US will be launched. Real-time payments are already a reality in, very, in many, many countries. Issue is real-time payments across border. And I think when if you look at the Ripple protocol and you look at the other blockchain protocols that are offering real-time ledger settlements, faster payments will be the norm. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's, it's analogous to, you know, email. Fast or slow will not be an option. For example, in today if you have to email, you do not have the option, well, I want to send this email faster and I want to send this email slowly. You just send an email. I think the same analogy would be uh, applicable to MTOs transferring money. Non-real-time payment players would essentially go out of business. It makes no sense for someone to come to you because you're settling remittances on the other side of the border in three to five days or five to six days. If that remittance is not being settled immediately, well, you know, you're gonna lose customers. Being digital is essentially uh, a necessity today. Extending beyond the physical realm, understanding conversion metrics, you have to go online, you have to be digital. Brick and mortar is fine, but digital is coming. You know, there are many people, opponents who will say, well, you know, 90% of the world's remittances are done in, you know, in brick and mortar stores. That is correct. They are done so because the alternative for the kind of people who are coming at the stores are not present yet, but they are slowly coming over there. They are slowly being digitized. The people who are walking in into your physical location do have access to Facebook, do have access to Twitter, do have email and they will slowly accept digital payments if there is a solution provided to them. 
So planning for OTT product offering is something very important, expanding beyond the P2B transfer. There is much more to remittances than just sending money across. It is very important for money transfer operators and money services businesses to understand that there is much more to their ecosystem than just the physical world that they operate in. Being digital today is a necessity. And if MTOs are not gravitating towards that necessity, they are going to be losing out. Uh, Being digital has a lot many advantages. You can understand your your customers, you can understand your conversion metrics, you can understand you know where they're coming from, what their personas are, etc. And if you have OTT play in the offering, it makes the whole equation even better. As an MTO, if you're not gravitating towards the digital play, I think you will lose out in the coming years. I think you will lose out very fast because cash is being discouraged. Um, brick and mortar stores, you know, are do not the regulators are not relying on the KYC that brick and mortar stores are now collecting. I think digital payments is is the future. Uh, eventually, that will be the reality. And if you're not gravitating towards being digital, you will essentially go out of business. I keep talking about this concept of value transfers. The lowest hanging fruit for any money transfer operator is needless to say, you know, doing a person to person transfer. But there are so many things above a P2P that MTOs should now be looking at, and some of them are. You must have heard about things like um, a bill payment or mobile top-ups, but now there is margin arbitrage with value-added offerings. For example, being able to buy a supermarket IOU coupon or supermarket credits uh, for your family, being able to buy petrol or gas or pay for utility bills, and guess what? These supermarkets, these utility companies will give you cash back. It is very important that MSPs understand that they have to go up the value chain rather than being stagnated in the P2P transfers. On-ground alliances offer a much more a la carte service. If someone is doing from USA to India, they can start aligning themselves with school fees payments, with uh, you know the localized wallets, with the uh, the best supermarket chain or grocery chain or utility bill chain and so forth. These are all value-added incomes that an MSB can capitalize on for additional income that they're currently not, are, are not doing. So this is a big one. I, I, literally fist fights break out sometimes when I mention this. Fee or free? Is money going to be free or is money going to be charged for a fee later on? I think eventually we will move towards the fee free model rather than the fee model. Is value transfer moving to the same direction as information transfer? Absolutely. I think today the ability to transfer value digitally has about the same cost as transferring data digitally. The expansion of value transfer networks will put pressure on base pricing, which basically means that the the 4% or the 3% or the 6% that you're charging now will have a lot of added pressure on it. You will be forced to lower your price. How will you counter a, if you look at the, uh, let's say if you look at the last 20 years, the cost of remittances is going down. So one has to ask the question, what happens in the next 10 years? If the price goes down so low that it becomes essentially free, how do you counter it? How do you stay in business? What do you have to do to adjust for a market that is zero fee based? Small value transfers are a huge market. Today, in most cases, and I have to stress on the word most, uh, there are exceptions, but in most cases, being able to transfer $5 or $3 or $10 or, or even $22 is not economical. It costs a lot of money to transfer that. But the ability to transfer micropayments like $1, $5, or $6, small value transfers will become a reality in the coming days. Imagine you are working in Chicago, your wife is working in Manila, she's at the checkout counter, she's $3 short. There has to be a solution where where the husband in Chicago is able to message her and send her the $3 instantly. That $3 instant credit saves her the embarrassment. You know, she can go check out with the ease. And it's an instant credit. So it's an end-to-end transfer that happens almost instantaneously, just like real-time messages. What is the economic size of such an opportunity? Well, let me give you an example. It's like literally going into the city of New York and saying, well, today, no transaction below $100 can happen. 
imagine the impact that statement will have on a city like New York or London or Delhi or Bombay or Manila. You just take away so many thousands of millions of transactions away from this from the from the ecosystem because any transaction less than a hundred dollars cannot happen. This is exactly what is happening in the in the world of money transfers. You there is a floor price. You are not able to send money economically below let's say a hundred dollars. But imagine if that floodgates were open. Imagine if there was a possibility to send money less than a hundred dollars. You are talking billions and billions of dollars that are going going to be transacted. By some estimates, some people think that cross border small value transfer shares will essentially climb to a trillion dollars. I wouldn't be surprised. Education and awareness. This is easy to do. You know, we need to have people come out of sight, come outside their comfort zones, step outside their comfort zones, have first-hand experience in field visits. This means specifically banks, regulators, policymakers, compliance heads, processors, lawyers, government, remitters. They all need to get out of their comfort zone and look at what's happening. I actually have a count of 37 regulators. These are 37 regulators, state examiners, who actually write regulations for their individual um, geographic entities, uh, financial uh, entities, that regulate money transfer. Yet not one of them, not, of, not one of the 37, has ever gone into a beneficiary country and see how money is received, or has ever done remittances themselves overseas. Not that they need to, but at least if I were writing regulations, I'd like to go and see it, right? So I think this is absolutely conniving of them not to be able to go into the field. I, I think it is absolutely essential that they have to go out in the field, they have to experience it, and we have to, con and that's the only way they'll get continually educated about the uh, on-ground realities. Coming towards something not so easy, banking. I think access to banking, as we all know, is being limited, is on, is on a decline. Banks are now dictating which corridors you can work with and which you cannot. You know, the fear, uncertainty, doubt factor, you know, from choke point, this operation choke point, it has to be reversed. Rights to banking should be a fundamental right for everyone, including MSB businesses. The, the fact that the regulators are now pushing people out of banking, I think, will lead to more damage than good. The argument cited is that, you know, we are controlling money laundering, we are controlling, you know, terrorist financing, etc. Well, if you're controlling it, then set the standards. Don't just deny them. You know, don't deny people banking. Don't deny MSB banking. Because when you place hurdles, money goes underground. Everyone knows about this thing. So I think banking is going to be a huge challenge in the coming days, in the coming years. Identity and ID management. Um, you know, we need to go beyond the specific KYCs that we do right now, beyond just ID checks. We need to look at identification in the 21st century, the way we are today. We need to look at tokenization. We need to look at OAuth, OAuth equivalent. What's the OAuth equivalent for an ID? Wouldn't it be nice if I could share my passport, my driver's license, my identification, that beyond a shadow of a doubt would confirm who I am? Yet, because of tokenization, I would be at ease that my information cannot be abused. What is the OAuth equivalent for IDs. Where is the worldwide standard? Do you know that we've been using the same template for the last, I don't even know, 50, 60, 70 years? The template has not changed. Why haven't we changed the identification templates? I think in the coming years, you will see a lot with respect to consensus-based IDs, with respect to the blockchain coming in and, and the ID coming on the blockchain. And I think we will gravitate towards that. The world is very disenfranchised when it comes to ID checks. We just have these PEP lists and this OFAC sanction list and so forth where we are doing checks. But there really isn't a mechanism where we can really dig deep into a particular economy or a particular geography and understand the elements that make that identification of that person in that economy and are able to juxtapose it as an ID check worldwide. Uh, this, I think, is not, is not an easy problem to solve, but it is something that would need solving. Regulation and compliance is a huge issue. I think it takes up most of the time, and everyone will tell you that, you know, um, we are just keeping up with the regulations that are coming out. For example, today, 
uh, in certain states in the U.S., if you were to ask for clarification, it can take between three and nine months for that clarification to come out. What do you do in the interim period? Why isn't there a pooled consensus? Why is it, you know, what if you get fined for it? What, you know, how do you keep up with all these regulations and who, what if you miss it out? There is just so much confusion in the world of compliance and regulation uh, that has made it an absolute mess. State level regulation sometimes contradicts federal regulations. Uh, sometimes circulars that come out later in the year are contradicting circulars that came out a couple of years before. There is such a spaghetti mess, if you will, in the world of regulation and compliance that we need to look at it from a fresh pair of eyes. We need to simplify regulations. Pool consensus is something we, sh we need to look at more and more because of the amount of regulations that are being uh, channeled out on a daily basis. We need to have an industry association give an opinion on the regulations that are coming out. And a pooled consensus approach would make sense saying, okay, this is what we think we, the regulator means by it. And the consensus uh, says, says otherwise, or maybe saying the same, and we're going to be utilizing that. Questionable transactions. What is bad versus not bad? A person sending money from Chicago to Islamabad in Pakistan, all good, nothing wrong except now that the person who's received the money goes out and gives money to his landlord. The landlord happens to be on a terrorist watch list. Was this transaction good or bad? The simple answer is it's not clear. It depends if the prosecutor wants to go against this case or not. But who gets chastised in the middle? The MTO gets does. So a clear-cut mandate on the liability of such transaction needs to be put out. How much responsibility does a bank take? How much responsibility does an MTO take for a transaction that may end up being bad? But because we don't have any a priori information on that person who where the money would eventually be is being channeled to, how can the bank be uh, liable for it? How can the MSB be liable for it? The law is very, very gray in this area. We need to make the law very black and white and the responsibility matrix needs to be very, very clearly defined. There is no standard insurance instrument in the money transfer business. Uh, you know, there's insurance in almost every facet of life. Money transfers, no insurance. Limited liability coverage for fines and other shortcomings which result in penalties. Well, guess what? You can't find insurance for it. So what if, why, why doesn't the insurance companies uh, or the insurance industry offer insurance against such transactions i don't know but i think we should it's worthwhile that we need to investigate lastly payment protocol i think we need to devise a more efficient payment protocol mechanism we do not currently have a protocol for example I'll, I'll give you some very simple examples you cannot take a paypal transaction and route it to an mto you just cannot do that because these are two inherently different systems it's like saying you know taking a a piece of butter and putting it on the rail tracks and the butter will travel. It just doesn't work that way. We do not have the ability to take a transaction or borrow a transaction or terminate a transaction from Western Union with another provider. We are able to trade gold contracts worldwide. We're able to trade FX contracts worldwide, but we cannot trade a remittance contract amongst our own players. And the reason that is, is because the system, the original system, the way transactions are bundled and, and transacted with, they're batched together in most cases, they're not independent, and they don't have, they don't carry all the necessary information in order to be traded. So what we need is a protocol that allows this transaction to be traded amongst various entities as easy as an email attachment goes from one email to the other. When we have an enhanced payment protocol, we will have a more efficient mechanism for delivering it. We'll have a more real-time mechanism for delivering it. We'll have a more robust mechanism for delivering it. So I think looking at a payment protocol is something that we need to look at, especially when it comes to looking at 220 plus geographic countries. We need to have something to tie it in inherently sure there's swift but swift is um, you know very has a very specific function uh, there are protocols like the blockchain there are protocols like the ripple inter in interledger uh, protocol and, and many others that are coming out but we need to decide what is going to be best for the money transfer industry 
That's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send it to me. My email is fk at I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.